Hi, I am William Waterway, and welcome to the William Waterway interview on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Today, my guest is Wendy Benchley, Peter Benchley's widow, Peter Benchley, renowned as the author of Jaws. And this week on Martha's Vineyard, we are celebrating Jaws Fest 2012, and we are very honored that Wendy Benchley, the president of the board of Shark Savers International, was able to visit us on Martha's Vineyard and to come into our studio today and to share some thoughts about the making of Jaws and most importantly, protecting the sharks on planet Earth. So thank you, Wendy Benchley, for being here today as my guest. Thank you, William. I'm glad to be here. You have done a lot in your life. And you've done a lot for the environment. Going back to your days in New Jersey. Yes, <laughs> yes, I have. In the I, 70s. Yeah. Oh, you've done some research. I have. Oh, yeah, I spent eight years mm -hmm. fighting an incinerator. On, in New Jersey. Oh, was it Tuck Island? Uh, on, on Duck Island. Duck Island, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we finally uh, won, but I'll have to say it was not because of our efforts. It was more a court case that was settled, that um, garbage is a commodity that needs to be able to cross state lines. Mm -hmm. And they decided that New Jersey did not have the right to uh, keep all garbage within the state and send it to their incinerators. So it was fine. The result was what we wanted. Incinerators were canceled, mm. and um, they, they had one scheduled for every single county in New Jersey. It would have been... An environmental oh, catastrophe. Just, just yes. hideous. Yeah. So, and then recycling took off more. I mean, that was the main... And you were on the reason. front end of recycling. I was. Yes. I was. God, I've in forgotten the, all about the, that. the Princeton area, was it? <laughs> that was in the Princeton area. Yeah. yeah. So I did a lot of that. I helped to um, start the New Jersey Environmental Federation which was an umbrella organization. And that was in the early 70s? Early 70s, yeah. Very good. And then I worked on the Environmental Defense Fund board. I was on their board for, I think, 18 years. Which is a huge national yeah. organization. Yes, really. A, mm -hmm. Oh, a wonderful Do organization. Do a lot of good work, yes. Very effective. They use uh, market-based ideas to, to bring corporations and other people into the world and using market um, mechanisms to make environmental regulation. Um, I forgot to turn off my cell phone. You did? I did. Oh, I like that It's a sweet tone. little tone, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. So, in any case, we um, working with environmental defense was, was very exciting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now, you were with the EDF for a very long time. Yeah, a good 18 years. Yes. Yeah. And I know they, um, I mean, I'm, one of the things I remember um, was they worked with McDonald's. McDonald's had mm -hmm. incinerators scheduled mm -hmm. for, for, for thousands of their stores. They were going to incinerate right behind their stores, all the clamshells. And, and EDF works privately and quietly with the corporations and brings them along. And then they together come out with um, what, what their solutions are to the problems. Mm -hmm. And so they came. They got rid of the clamshell. They came out with recycled, well, yes. what you get now, yes. recycled paper and cardboard containers. Well done. Yeah, and then um, you you may have heard of catch shares. Have you heard of catch shares? Mm -mm. Uh, that's um, an EDF generated idea, uh, and a very good example of catch shares is in the Gulf of Mexico for red snapper catch. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that that. Fishermen um, should have a share in the, the commodity that they're fishing. And if they have a share, they will take care of it. And they won't fish it out because they want to have that commodity grow. Yes. And um, so right. they're given a share of the total catch. Mm -hmm. And it means that the fishermen can go out any time during the year. They can go out when the market is better for them. They don't have certain times of the year when they are allowed to fish, um, and it, it, it works very well. So that's yeah. coming, I know that Jane Lubchenco very, uh, good. Ha, is good trying to institute it along the East Coast, and it's very controversial, as mm -hmm. almost any, I mean, any regulations are controversial. So um, 
Uh, and change of habit, too. Yes, yeah, uh, difficult. But I like that. It's kind of like uh, fair share, like when you're dealing with uh, people who grow cocoa or mm, yes. coffee beans. Yes, very they much They have so. a vested interest. Yeah. And uh, it's well done to incorporate that into the harvesting of fish, turtles, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. And then EDF also worked with UPS. What did you do with UPS? Oh, yes, they worked with yeah. UPS on, on, yeah, that's on another electric vehicles. International and, corporation. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and um, so that's um, a natural gas, I think. Gosh, I, I haven't looked at that mm -hmm. in a while. But, um, and I remember one thing that, <laughs> that they figured out is that the root that they take, if you always take a right-hand turn and you don't stop and try to go left and then come around, you save huge amounts of gas. But, um, but they, oh, and they've, they've done many more things. Um, and of course, they've been leaders in climate legislation. So that was just a shame that we didn't get um, cap and trade, I thought, mm -hmm. or some kind of a carbon tax um, through, through the Congress, because uh, I, I do still believe that we need to have some kind of a carbon tax mm -hmm. that would help us to keep wind and electric and natural gas energy going. And um, and if we if if we can't you know if we can't tax carbon and then have that money help us on other other kinds of energy, um, it's going to be a tough road. And after all, we you know we've yeah. been subsidizing. Mm -hmm. roads and subsidizing mm -hmm. the gas companies, the oil companies, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. years. So uh, You almost sound like a congresswoman. <laughs> you have your mind wrapped around it nationally, internationally, uh, well, uh, I, all the I levels. Did, I was in politics in New Jersey I, I for a while. You were a freeholder yeah. in Princeton, correct? I was a freeholder in Mercer County. In Mercer County. Yeah. A freeholder is a free man mm -hmm. who holds land. Ah. It comes from those days. Okay. So I enjoyed that. I did that for about three years. And then instead of going to the state or the national level, a lot of friends said, oh, Wendy, you know, give it a try. But I, I really like hands-on government, you know, hands-on situations where I can dig in and make something happen. And I also mm -hmm. wanted to keep my life flexible enough so that I could go with Peter on some of these dive trips and experience the ocean with him firsthand. Mm. So I went local and mm -hmm. uh, was elected to Princeton Borough mm -hmm. Councilwoman. Mm -hmm. And that was, I loved it, I loved it. I did that for about 10, 10 years. You did a lot of very worthwhile projects for the community there as well. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. I think I, I um, worked hard with Marvin Reed, the mayor, and the rest of Borough mm -hmm. Council to redevelop the downtown area. Mm -hmm. We had a, an asphalt parking lot in the middle of town. Uh, yes, it parked cars, but it was very unsightly. It didn't park very many cars. So we decided that we would do good urban planning, make that into a plaza, uh, put an apartment building beside it, we had the library on one side, a plaza, an apartment building, and behind the apartment building, build a garage. So it was hidden, and uh, we were able to park hundreds of cars. And I think it did a great deal to revitalize the downtown and to give more people living there, mm -hmm. uh, which support the stores, yes. all the local stores. Yeah. And uh, we're now having Palmer Square is um, the, the apartments are being built now in Palmer Square. So I think, you know, Princeton, we've got a lively downtown. And with the university, it's, it's, yeah. it's a great, it's a and great also, place. And also, you helped to get a lot of trees planted. Well, I did. I did that. Yeah, I was on the, the Shade Tree, tree. Shade tree Commission. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very important. Very important. But we had an interesting controversy mm -hmm. uh, with, the, uh, with the church there. Uh, the church was trying to be very good with energy, um, the use of energy, and they wanted to put solar panels on their roof. In order to have the solar panels work, they needed to cut down a huge tree that was in their backyard. And there you had the, the sort of the nitty-gritty of, of the details. So which 
Yeah. Which was more Which, important, yes. save the tree? Yes. Now, as it turned out, we were lucky. We, we dodged a bullet <laughs> uh, because the tree turned out to be diseased. And it had to come down anyway. <laughs> but we did. We went to some of the Princeton professors mm -hmm. and asked them to give us an analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think the overall analysis that, uh, that Sokolov did was that the trees actually were more important overall, to keep the big shade trees because they did, they made the use of energy in the church less. Um, now Bob and they're also a carbon sink. And they're a carbon sink, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. birds. Yeah. yeah, and birds. Oh yeah, so, so many different things. Many, so, many, many. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was a fascinating job being on, on Borough Council. Mm -hmm. And we, we worked hard with housing, mm -hmm. affordable housing. So that the development that is now going into Palmer Square, uh, they were required to have uh, some low-income housing as part of their development. And we did it with another apartment building that went up and with the one that we built. So we, we had a strong commitment to try to keep a really good diversity of people in Princeton. And green engineering with L-E-E-D? Oh, with LEED, yes, yes. LEED. Very that nice. I was on the planning board for mm -hmm. years, really, yeah. I don't know, I think maybe 15, 20 years. And um, we, we never did actually pass LEAD legislation, but the planning board was absolutely intent on it. And so most big developers who came in, and the university certainly, mm -hmm. did LEAD buildings. And they knew that we wanted to see that they were doing that. Uh, so the university did quite a few ones. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Now, the That's New good. Jersey Environmental Federation in the 70s. Do you remember in New Jersey in the 1970s, the early 1970s, the use of the 1899 Refuse Act to indict industries for polluting rivers? I don't remember that. Do you do remember that? that? No. Okay. Good right. for you. But there was uh, Gordon Bishop, the... Oh, yeah. Do uh, you remember him from the Newark yes. Star Ledger? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Gordon Bishop was great. Yeah. He's won more awards oh, for environmental yeah. journalism. Yeah. Than, uh, yeah, yeah. No, and, and um, I, I just remember him, and I remember a lot of stories he wrote, and he yes. was the one that was... Oh, no, he wrote the stories. He wrote the story But I was the one the who investigated the industries and had them indicted on my evidence, oh, my water analyses bravo, and photographs, William. you know, when I was a sophomore at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So Helen Fenske, I remember bravo, Ella Philippone from Passaic bravo. River Coalition. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they, the, she had to be part of your New Jersey Environmental Federation. Definitely they were. And yeah, Clean Ocean big. Action with Cindy yeah. Zip and, and okay. many different people. Mm. I, you know, when I, I, I got less locally involved when I was working with EDF. Mm. So, um, but we did something called Home Safe Home, uh, which, which is which was using toxic chemicals in the home, showing people how they could not use the chemicals and instead use natural ingredients to clean and to freshen the air. And we got the um, Jeez, you're way ahead of the, the curve. governor's prize, yeah, well Governor done. Florio's prize well done. for. Yeah, that was that you were was way ahead of the curve. Fun. They're still promoting They're still that today, trying, trying to, to educate. Going. Yeah, I you know I do think that it just we were going we were going full steam ahead with recycling and and um, and trying to get rid of the chemicals in the home and on the lawns. We were really forging ahead on Excellent. on toxicity on yes, the lawns and in golf courses. And um, then wow. Jane Nagaki kept going with the golf courses, and she mm. accomplished a lot mm. in New Jersey. But and then remember, um, uh, Prop, oh, the California law that was in the '70s. Oh, that was such a good law that they passed, where there was a whole list of chemicals, and if those any of those chemicals were in products that you were um, making, you had to declare them on your cleaning products. And California is very powerful that way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the uh, companies just changed their formula because of that exposure. And we all were convinced that this was going to go state by state across the country. Yeah, you would think. And we would make huge progress. Yes. And 
I don't know how we lost our way. I, we just didn't get the organization behind it to, to move it into other states, but we had a big opportunity there. It's too bad because now we're fighting the battle all over again. And there are wonderful groups now that are, that are mm -hmm. um, teaching young parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I certainly, when I talk to my daughters and son's age, mm -hmm. they're very aware of the mm -hmm. chemicals, and and there's so much more um, allergy, asthma. Um, I, my opinion is that there there have been so many autism. thousand autism. I have an autistic son, mm -hmm. grandson, mm -hmm. um, and uh, there just there are so many chemicals that are in the environment now, in the air and in the water, that happened after the Second World War. This is just my, my theory that our grandchildren are feeling the effects of it. I concur. Yeah. Yeah. But to, to prove that, as you know, would be, a, a, you, you, you just couldn't do it. A mammoth study. I mean, they would have to test thousands and thousands of people and then control and do double blind tests. And how are you going to do it with so many different chemicals? Well, they did it with DDT at the Madison, yes. Wisconsin trials. Yes, and they did. And it was in the late 60s and yeah. early 70s. And Ellen yeah. Seibergeld, mm -hmm. a scientist who was on the board of EDF, mm -hmm. did it with the hormone disruptors. Mm -hmm. um, she, she did great work on yeah. that. And uh, it makes me think of, um, oh, there was an article years ago in, in the New Yorker, a writer, who had gone and gotten his blood tested. Yes. And he had... I mean, he just, he had so many different chemicals at various levels in his body. And, of course, if you took just one, it was under the level, the acceptable level. But come on, if you've got 80 chemicals just under the acceptable level, that's a pretty aggressive onslaught on your immune system. Well, then there are body. synergisms. Yes, that right, occur that we don't know. Esoteric chemicals being manufactured in our bodies that are beyond our abilities to even analyze. Yes, you know, yes. So we're children in this chemical yeah. forest that we've created. Yeah, we know. surely we, there's, are. There's that book that recently came out, Wendy, it was called Toxic Baby, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was similar to this reporter. They did an analysis of the blood of the of baby. Of the newborn. Of the newborn. <gasps> and it was just loaded with chemicals. Oh my. You know. I haven't read that. Yes. So that's where we are today. That is where we are. We've evolved to creating this environment that we breathe, that we drink the water and eat the food from. Yeah. And it's... And we're lucky. We're older. We're older. That's right. We, we, we aren't as... We are fortunate. Yeah. We don't have the onslaught yes. in our bodies. That's right. Yeah. So sometimes I, I think, you know, in a way the mercury in fish are going to help mm. us save the fish because <laughs> people won't <laughs> eat it because of the That's high right. mercury count. So, yeah. you know, here we are. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Mm. But this is nice to get a picture of you with all the environmental work you were doing in the early 70s. Now let's talk about a subject that we came on board to discuss, yeah. and that is uh, the film Jaws, uh, which was the, the um, reflection of this book, Jaws, that was written by Peter Benchley. Wendy's um, husband, uh, she met Peter Benchley on Nantucket at the Jared Coffin House. Mm -hmm. And what I like about their meeting was that Wendy as she prefaced earlier when I was talking with her, was working there. And what I read was, in her autobiographical material, uh, she was a hostess upstairs, and she went downstairs to help out. If you've ever been to the Jared Coffin House, there's that little restaurant downstairs. It's kind of a nice pub atmosphere. And um, she went down to help out there, and there was this handsome man and he was smoking a Lucky Strike. And Wendy was a pack-a-day person back then. <laughs> <laughs> we many. can laugh about it. Too many. <laughs> Too many. Oh. But she uh, didn't have her cigarette, so she asked him if she could have a drag on his cigarette. 
And that is how she met Peter. And within two weeks of that sharing of that Lucky Strike cigarette, they were planning marriage. Yes, correct? that's that's, that's, exactly that's right. Point. The infatuation it was, it was, was... It was zip. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I was, <laughs> I thought, I, I can't believe now that uh -huh. I asked him for a drag. I didn't even yeah. ask him for a cigarette. I just yeah. asked him for a drag. That uh -huh. was very provocative. <laughs> anyway, and then he came and asked me where the men's room was. Uh -huh. And then I, he came back and asked me for a date. And I had the wit to mm -hmm. break my date with the cook in the kitchen. And I went out mm -hmm. with Peter. Wise choice. A wise choice, yes. yeah. Now, he was visiting Nantucket. He was a reporter for the Washington Oh, yeah, no, but he his parents right. had a house there. Okay, they went there every summer for years, and All that's right. how Peter was so involved with the ocean because he did a lot of body surfing, and fishing with his dad, and so so that was his summer place. Okay, he grew up there, All right. and so we were just together for a couple weeks on the island. I quit my job at the Jared Coffin House, and went out and lived in in one of those darling little houses in Sconset. Had a room there, and then I cleaned houses. For people in Sconset, and we were talking earlier about cleaning houses for Walter. Yes, Cronkite, Walter Cronkite for Walter and Betsy, <laughs> and Walter. Then I'd go to cocktails at Walter's house with the Benchleys, and and Walter would wipe his finger along the table and say, mm, "I don't know whether my my housekeeper has done the job." Mm -hmm. So it was it was a golden time. But then Peter went mm -hmm. off down to write for the Washington Post, mm -hmm. um, and. Then he got the job with Newsweek. In New York. In New York, yeah. yeah. So, so we, we lived in New York. And then he went um, and wrote speeches for Johnson. And that was very exciting. Uh, as he said, I, I really wasn't very good. He was just not made to be a speechwriter. But, uh, but it was exciting to be there. And uh, I, it's very funny how he was hired, because we mm -hmm. were um, at a, a dinner and I cannot remember why we were at this dinner. I think it was because Peter was doing a story on the White House. I've, I've got to find out about this. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I sat next to Bob Kintner. And Kintner was the head of the speechwriters at the White House. And on that day, Johnson had been particularly upset with a story that had been written um, about him. And you know, he felt the press was a liberal and didn't understand him and had been very unfair to him. So he had said to Kintner, find me one of those Harvard-educated, pinko, liberal writers and hire him as a speechwriter and maybe the press will take better care of me. So I was sitting next to Kintner uh, and, he, and uh. Bob is saying, hmm, Benchley, Benchley. Aren't you connected to Peter Benchley and Nat Benchley and Robert Benchley? And I said, yes, through my husband, I am. And he said, OK, maybe Peter's the one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he called Peter the next day. Uh, and, uh, and that's how Peter was hired. So down we went. Quite the accolade to be a speechwriter for a president of the United States, especially during yeah. that time. Yeah, it was, was it was a, very dramatic. It had to be a oh yeah, very, and and friends, to write speeches at that time yeah. about Vietnam. Well, Peter only sort of Peter never he only yeah. wrote one right. speech for Johnson okay. that had anything to do with Vietnam. Yeah, and it was completely nerve wracking for him because be. yeah. yeah because Johnson, as you know, his policy was in a constant flux and he was torn about it and and he usually no matter what anybody wrote when it was about Vietnam he would tear it up and say what he was going to say anyway, you know, spur of the moment, mm. because it was, it was so complex. But we had a lot of friends from New York who called and, and wanted to come down and spend the night in our house when they were, did the march. And, and we, and Peter sort of said, I don't think I can do that. I work for Johnson. I don't think I can have a whole house full of, of friends. But, um, but we did have one. We had, uh, do you remember when Betty Furness? was appointed the first consumer affairs advocate. Mm. Betty Furness, who was the Westinghouse woman, uh, she was actually the, another generation. That was a breaking older. through the ceiling type of appointment. Yes, yes, yes it was. And she came, the reason I thought of her was, she came to our house for mm -hmm. dinner, and I had learned how to make chicken Kiev. I was quite proud mm -hmm. of my chicken Kiev. And so we had a dinner party for Betty to welcome her to Washington. And uh, 
I put the chicken into the hot boiling oil, yeah. and, the, and the oil was a little bit too hot. Boom, fire. The kitchen was just wow. the stove. Yeah. And so <laughs> Peter came sure. in and Betty came in, and we've got the, the fire extinguisher. We put out the fire. It was all right. But Betty, being a smart um, woman about getting a little presence in the Washington Post press, she called and said, well, I've got a little story to tell you. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> first Wendy commissioner, <laughs> and Wendy Benchley set fire to his kitchen just to see whether I could prove my mettle on the ground, and mm -hmm. I got the fire. Anyway, it was fun. We had a wonderful time in yeah. Washington. Mm -hmm. And then when, when Peter was, uh, when Johnson decided not to run. Was it 1968? Yeah. Yes. So Peter was out of work, and um, yeah. we, he went freelance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were we were living modestly. To Another say the starving various, writers. Yeah, scenario. yeah. Scenario. You your first daughter came along. Yes, about yes. that time. Tracy. But my parents helped us. Yeah, they okay. helped us buy a house. Uh -huh. uh, and we were thank heavens they could do it because yes. we were yeah. not. You just don't make enough money to live. And then Peter wrote that wrote that book. He wrote the book. Mm -hmm. He had these two ideas. Mm -hmm. um, one was, well, either it was an idea about a fish, yeah. a big fish yeah. that terrorizes the town, or it was an idea about pirates or dinosaurs. And every once in a while he would get taken out to lunch in New York and he'd present the ideas and see whether anybody was going to bite, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, finally Tom Congdon said, I like the one about the fish. Why don't you write me uh, first chapter, and uh, I'll give you a thousand dollars advance, and let's see where it goes. So, Peter wrote the first uh, part of the book as um, a, con a, a humorous book, and then Tom said, "Why don't you take out all the humor and just make it straight story?" Which was definitely exactly what it should be. So uh, Peter wrote it in. We were in Pennington then, and mm -hmm. Peter wrote in the furnace repair. The Blackwell got, furnace. The Blackwell furnace. furnace. Now, why uh -huh. did he write it in the Blackwell furnace repair <laughs> shop? <That's> because <laughs> we had no money for an <laughs> office for him, right. and we were I had two little kids at home, Yeah. and that was a little more chaotic even than the furnace repair shop. So he sat there with everybody clanging oh and my God. soldering. and Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think his uh, training yeah. as... Um, he had very good training. His dad actually helped him. Um, when Nantucket, uh, during the first couple years of Harvard, he, during the summer, he said to his dad, I really would like to try to be a writer. And his dad said, great, but you know, you don't want to ever have writer's block. There's just nothing worse than writers who can't sit down and pound it out. And so his dad said, I'll tell you what, you usually earn money mowing lawns during the summer. So instead of mowing lawns, I will pay you what you would make. And you get up every morning at 7 o'clock and you go out to the workshop. They had a workroom across the street and write. He said, I don't care what you write, but you must produce something every day. Very and good. And it was very good training for yes. him. Yes, yeah. So he um, did that. And then, of course, when he worked for Newsweek, that was also good training. You, you, you have to get those stories out. You That's cannot right. sit back and, you know, uh, and you have to be concise and very clear in your writing. And I think Peter's uh, prose style is very direct and clear and sparse. It is. Yeah. It's like poesy. Yeah. You know, it's like literature in a poetic form. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, you as a poet, I mean, yeah. that's really sparse and meaningful. Every yes, single word yes. counts for poetry. Yes, Wendy. Yes. yes. <laughs> so that's why I can appreciate someone who yeah. writes of that genre who is um, capable of write, giving us so much so succinctly. Yeah. You know, and yeah. He, he, did, he worked and, hard on that. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. And he, he believed very much Did in you that. read it while it was the work in progress? Were you the, someone yeah, that... I did. I in, did. Uh, not gave a lot. Him your, all right. Not a lot. In fact, you, you um, thought that the idea wasn't a good idea. In yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just a right. terrible idea. You did? Yeah, all I right. said, oh, honey, you know, <laughs> think of something else. Well, I, you know, 
But of course, I don't have the kind of imagination that he had. So I, right. I just couldn't even conceive of how he mm. would put together these characters yes. and have such interesting characters and depth and the whole yes. conflict between the town and the mayor and the tourist trade and, and Brody, the chief. So, so I was just too much of a neophyte to even begin to appreciate how he was going to construct this novel. And, uh, and he, was, he was a very, uh, he did a lot of writing in his head. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd take long walks mm -hmm. and think it through in his head and how the plot was going to go and how the characters would be developed. And then, and then he'd just sit down and ch -ch 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 -ch. And what did he and write on? A, a manual typewriter? Yeah, he had a manual typewriter. And then he had a Smith the old, Corona. Yeah. yeah. And then the old Selectrix. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The IBM Selectric that came out. Yeah. The, but he had uh, a really ancient one up in, mm. up in Nantucket for a while. So when he wrote Jaws, what did he use for a typewriter, Wendy? Do you remember? He, in the Blackwell Furnace Repair yeah, Shop. Yeah, yeah. He had one of the, I still have those typewriters. You do? Yeah, yeah. Is, was it a Smith Corona? It was a... Manual, or was it the Selectric? I think it was the Selectric. Okay. I'd, I'll have to go back In the early look. 70s. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the so, book came out in 74. Yeah. So he was writing it in 1970, he started, didn't he, about in, then? Oh, oh no, he wrote it quicker than that. I think okay. he... Oh, I think he wrote it oh, in... The, the movie came out in 74. 74. So book came so out... Well, the, you know, the book and the movie were... Yeah. So he... You know, I have to go back and look at his yeah. date book, but I think he wrote that book in a year and a half. Uh, because then he went up to Stonington, Connecticut, mm -hmm. which is where my my family has a summer mm -hmm. place. Mm-hmm. Pretty and, country. Um, there was a chicken coop, and yeah. he cleaned out the chicken coop yeah. and did the rewrites up there. So, so that was that was fun. Um, we were up there with the kids, and and uh, yeah. it was lovely. It was a golden time. And how many children? Two children. Yeah. Um, I had three children, but um, yeah. our youngest son died just recently in an Which accident. Which one? Christopher, who was twenty-four. My. Yeah. Oh, how sad. In a, a oh, that's got tragic. A... Yeah, yeah. Oh. So he was much younger than Tracy and Clay. Um, mm. Tracy's almost 45 now, and Clay is 40, 43. Now, you and have a nephew named Bob who's a photographer out yes, in Sconset? Yes, yes, in Sconset. Yeah. Uh -huh. He used to photograph when I was publishing Nantucket. I was the founding publisher of Nantucket Magazine. Oh, you were? And I published oh. a lot of your nephew's photographs. Uh-huh. Oh, he's a great photographer. great photographer. And he has a good book out. Oh, he did? Yeah. Yeah, good. on Nantucket. Photography, and then Excellent. Peter had a has a younger brother, mm -hmm. Nat Benchley, uh, who is an actor and uh, um, and a marvelous guy, <laughs> <laughs> and he's very connected to Nantucket also. Uh, yeah. So getting back to Jaws, Peter writes the book, and it gets purchased by a publisher. Yeah. And rather quickly, yeah. the movie rights sold. It was quite remarkable. Yes. Yeah. Well, Tom Kong And for a remarkable mm -hmm. sum of money. Mm-hmm. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, when we got that phone call, yeah. when Peter got that phone call, I remember we were in Pennington. Mm -hmm. I remember him standing in the kitchen yeah. with the phone and saying, oh my God. <laughs> and he told me, and I just burst into tears. Yeah. I, I don't know. I thought it was going to ruin our life. Mm -hmm. I had this feeling of, oh, I, I just think this is too much. And, and we were very happy in Pennington. And I had mm -hmm. also known people. And, of course, Peter had known people where a big bolt of money like that can just just devastate you and change your life too much. And, but I think we were lucky because we both, certainly the Benchleys had been around people who were famous, who were writers, who some had made a lot of money, some had not made a lot of money. And we had a very solid families and solid friends. So I think we kept quite grounded mm -hmm. through it all. But, but there, it was a bit of a, it was a jolt. It was a trauma. Um, 
I'm getting a little far afield, but I, I remember, no. I remember feeling um, like my my core had been taken away from me. Um, people, when they looked at me, they just looked at me as uh, now a, the wife of a famous person. And, um, and I remember a lot of women that I had had very uh, aggressive conversations with about public policy issues. I was part of the League of Women Voters and we always you know, had good, good conversations. And a lot of them just sort of backed off and wouldn't argue with me anymore and wouldn't do this kind of very real interaction. And I remember uh, Peter, mm. when we would go to big parties, some people would just, they would just be resentful of him. And they would be, they would just uh, think he was being too big of a hotshot. He hadn't even opened his mouth and they would have preconceived notions. So that took us a little while to get over. Um, it took, I would say, a couple years, for, for me at least. And um, of course, Peter was so busy with what he needed to do, and then, um, and then they asked us to go down to American Sportsman, asked us to go to South Australia to swim with the big whites. Actually, they were very funny. They called Peter and they said, well, okay, city boy, uh, you know, <laughs> now that you've written this book, uh, would you be interested in going and, yeah. and going into a cage and, and seeing what the real thing is like? And Peter said, yep, yep, I'd like to do that, but I'd like to have Stan Waterman along with me. And Stan's a great underwater photographer who is still alive and oh, still taking dive tours, dive him. trips. Oh, wow. wonderful. Almost 90 now. That's, oh, that's and wonderful. yeah, so we went down. Yeah. And uh, Rodney Fox mm -hmm. was the one who took us out. And in those days, uh, they, had, they had a big half a horse. That was the bait for the great white. And they had no. chum. Yeah. Wait a minute. It was really gross. A horse. Yeah, it was they, no, they, from the average. They, they would cut it up? Well, it was just a big, yeah. Well, was it just the whole carcass no, no, of the, the horse? Hand, it was the hind. I'm sorry to no, say. No, no, this is. Uh, it was really. Because anyway. what the, uh, to, just to segue off of that, they've just discovered that doing these shark studies off of Australia and chumming the waters uh -huh. off the boats to do the studies to get the sharks to come, they've now discovered that this has exacerbated the shark attack problem because now sharks have become programmed to people with boats and food. Oh, yeah. This, this yeah. was just the past couple of weeks that oh, I was reading oh, about this. Oh. So here they're throwing horse meat overboard yeah, to attract they, the great whites. They stopped doing that. They stopped, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you, you, well, you we chum. Can, yeah. chum the waters with something with blood. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fish yeah. blood and yes. all kinds of blood then. But they, they quickly went to just fish. But right. we had quite an experience on that trip because yeah. all the photographers were around. Um, Stan got into his cage because he was going to take shots of Peter. Yeah. I, because it was, I was a woman, the only woman on the boat, and it was Australia <laughs> in the 70s, yeah. I was banished to the upper deck. Oh my. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. It was, it was a... Man's, man's world. Man's world in <laughs> Australia, right? <laughs> so I was on the upper deck yeah. looking down at all yeah. the action. Peter got into the cage. And that we had a beautiful female white who came up uh, and she was swimming around, but she came up once under the rope, the line that tied Peter's cage to the stern of the boat, mm -hmm. and she opened her mouth, got the rope caught Get between out. her teeth, and was furious. I mean, there she was, right. had this horrible thing in her mouth, she couldn't shake it off. So she was just whipping her tail around, and Peter's cage was going topsy-turvy. Went under the boat once, it popped back up again. My God. I was watching this yeah. from the upper deck and said, you know, screaming at the photographers, yeah. get that rope of out course. of his mouth. Yeah. And, um, and they, of course, were so intent on the action Right. Behind their lenses, you know how some photographers yes, are. Yes, they go into they, that place. They're they, in a different... They're, they're yeah. observers. Uh-huh. And so I thought, I'm not going to stay up here. So I went down, elbowed my way through the guys, waited till the shark came up, opened her mouth again, grabbed a hold of the line, and yanked it as hard as I could, got it out of her teeth. 
she was happy, she calmed down, the cage calmed down, everything was all right. They stayed in the water for another half an hour and got some great shots. And then Peter came up mm. saying, wow, that was just awesome, but then saying, what happened? Mm. And the first, you know, 10 minutes down there. And uh, <laughs> I said, why was I rocketing around? And uh, they told him that there had been a line in his mouth and that I yanked it out. And so he always told that story. And how said deep? I had saved how, his life. You, you probably did. Yeah. If it had severed the line, how deep was the water there, Wendy? Oh, oh the, the water is very deep. But, but these, yeah. um, these cages have flotation. Okay. So the cage would not sink. Mm -hmm. Um, the cage would float off a bit. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, there's that, have you ever heard the story about Carl, who was the, um, the double for, for Hooper in the movie? Mm -mm. Oh dear, this is just wonderful. Um, Rodney, I'm not Rodney, but Ron and Val Taylor, who mm -hmm. are the great shark, shark photographers from Australia, they were hired by Universal to do the uh, second unit shooting. And so since Peter had postulated that this shark was 24 feet, and since most white sharks are sort of 16 to 18 feet, if you're lucky, they had to figure out how to make this shark look like it was 24 feet. Good, best way to do it is have a very small cage and a very small person who goes into the cage so the 16-foot shark looks like a 24-foot shark. So there was a courageous stunt double um, midget, who was the name of Carl, and uh, he was great. He learned how to dive. They had a small tank for him. He was on the stern looking at this cage, and Ron and Val were there explaining to him <laughs> that it was absolutely safe. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> okay. And the shark came up, got caught again in the line, that attaches the cage to the boat. This shark just took that cage, ripped it off the stern of the boat, took it down to the bottom and smashed it. And my it God. popped back up, squished like a pancake. Oh my God. So Carl, Ron and Val, <laughs> looking at this, they turn to see whether Carl has seen this. Carl has disappeared. He <laughs> is nowhere to be found and they, they finally found him in the forecastle of the boat, curled up around a gin bottle, and Carl did not go back in the water again. He, he decided <laughs> that was it. Yes. So people yes. were very cognizant of the fact mm -hmm. that it's not completely safe. You can get into trouble in these cages. Now, that has never happened again, I'm here to say. And um, uh, I, I think they've figured out now. When, when Peter and I did our 40th wedding anniversary trip, um, that was what I wanted to do for our 40th, was go out to Guadalupe Island and see the great whites off of Guadalupe, which is just gorgeous. Um, we had maybe four or five beautiful female whites coming around the cage, just swimming by like these torpedoes. They're, they're Really mm. remarkable animals. They are. Yeah. They are beautiful. But the reason <clears throat> I thought of this was that they, I noticed that they always had wranglers on the boat that kept the lines up and they had poles where they would gently nudge the shark to keep them away from getting too involved between the, the cages mm -hmm. and the stern of the boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you curve. could still get into trouble. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that was a beautiful trip that we took, and um, I mean, it was my first time really being in the water for hour after hour with these with these gorgeous animals. And as I say, they uh, they just look like they they glide, they barely move their body, and they they just come out of nowhere and off they go and and back and forth. And but whenever they want that, we use tuna heads. For, for baiting them up. Whenever they wanted to take it, they would take it in a minute. You know, they were honestly, I think they were playing with us. They'd come up and sort of mouth it and not take it, and then when they wanted it, they'd take it. There was nothing you could do. You could not pull it out of their way. So um, that was a great trip. And mm -hmm. that was uh, the group that learned, um, that when we were there in 2000, and, when were we 
year there, 2003 or four, 2004. That was when they had just recently discovered that the Great Whites congregated out in the middle of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And that was a revelation. I mean, people were stunned. They had mm -hmm. always thought that sharks never, mm -hmm. great whites, yes. didn't really congregate. Um, so that was So you did a lot of um, those research projects and died with National Geographic. Yeah, yeah, with National Geographic. And earlier today we were talking about my yeah. friend Adam Geiger from Martha's Vineyard. Yeah who was with you at, at the Sea of Cortez. Yes, when, when we went out, out. When you and Peter and yeah. uh, some others went out there. And yeah. you had this beautiful story. Oh, this is a beautiful story. It was, they, it's heart-wrenching. Yeah, yeah. They, this was a trip to film yeah. the Hammerhead mm -hmm. Shark Congregation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, thousands, literally thousands of hammerheads swam into the Sea of Cortez and people were not sure what they were doing, but probably it was some kind of a mating time for them. And so the American mm. Sportsman was um, filming that. Michelle Hall was left on the boat, and um, she's Michelle Hall from Howard Hall and Michelle Hall, and they do these fabulous IMAX films mm -hmm. about sharks and, mm -hmm. and underwater photography. Mm -hmm. Really spectacular. So she was there. Uh, she, all, everybody else had left the boat to go off and film. She looked underneath the boat and she saw this shadow and she realized it was a giant manta ray. And she thought, well, I'll, I'll just put on a tank and go over and take a look and see what's happening. So she went down and very carefully got, hovered over his back and she saw that he had monofilament fishing line wrapped around his cephalic fins, mm -hmm. which are the, the, they look like horns. Yes. And um, she saw that it had uh, torn the flesh and oh, the flesh was sad. all hanging loose. Oh. And so she went up and yeah. she very gently took the line out and he shuddered every once in a while, but he didn't swim away. And she packed the flesh back in. So he obviously knew that what she yeah. was doing was helping him and then she stayed and he started to swim and it's you know just mm. these beautiful wings mm. just cruising through the ocean she hung on he took oh her my. for a ride for oh 10 or 15 my. minutes brought her back to the boat he stayed there the men came back from filming peter got on him he took Peter for a ride, oh, brought Peter back, oh my God. and he stayed for three days giving them oh. rides. Really a beautiful story. That Androcles is. and the lion, um, you know, the communication That's, between yeah. man and beast, don't call them beast, one animal to another animal, is um, just as remarkable in the ocean as it is on land. So Peter came back from that trip and wrote, he was so excited, and he wrote a book called The Girl of the Sea of Cortez. And it's a lovely tale about Paloma, a Mexican girl, and her relationship with a manta ray. And um, I, I, to me, it's a heartbreaking tale. It really uh, upsets me, but yeah. it's, it's a beautiful book. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Random House, I'm so thrilled, Random House is going to republish it as an e-book. And Excellent. we're gonna yeah, and we're gonna do a lot of bonus material with it, yeah. and beautiful pictures of manta rays, and and sort of get people engaged with the manta population mm -hmm. um, in the ocean, yeah. which by the way is now being finned also. No. Yeah. Oh, and they're taking their gills for a, a the Chinese for some Chinese medicine. It's oh, it's so sad. It's just so yeah. sad. Yes. So, but you know. Um, mm. Just back to this, uh, the relationship between animals in the ocean, and mm -hmm. I count us as an animal in the ocean when we're there yeah. diving. Um, Jim Abernathy and many uh, photographers are, are establishing contact with, with sharks in a way that we never thought possible. So Jim Abernathy has been feeding bull sharks, and one tiger shark called Emma 
And he's been doing it so often that they are so acclimatized to him that they, they're they very calm and they sort of line up and come in and sometimes take the food, sometimes they don't. But Emma is so used to him now and enjoys Jim so much that whenever he comes into the water, she's hovering there. This is an 18-foot tiger shark. And uh, Jim will lie down on the ocean floor and Emma will come up and nuzzle him like a dog would nuzzle you on your living room floor and then go away and then come back and nuzzle and they they have this communication. Yeah. Now I, I know it's controversial and people say well you shouldn't feed sharks because then but you know sharks don't come sharks come to food to the smell of fish and blood they don't just come to the smell of a human being. I mean I've been on so many dives and and I mean, you could get a hundred divers who will come in and tell you, we pray that a shark will come up and come speak to us or come somewhere near us when we're on a dive. They don't. They don't. They really don't come up unless you bait them up. And um, so I, I do not think that the, the few people who are feeding sharks and showing how you can have this interaction with them, I don't think they're creating a problem. You know, you, you reward your dog for good behavior. They're rewarding the sharks. So um, I, I think that's something that, that needs to continue to be studied before anybody can really say with surety that, that the feeding of sharks is somehow bringing them into just a normal swimmer. I don't think so. Unless you happen to be swimming right in the place where Jim Abernathy feeds the sharks. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And just one more quick story about um, uh, there was a, 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 a moray eel named, two moray eels named Waldo and Waldine mm -hmm. that were fed down in the Bahamas by Wayne and Ann Hansen. And uh, I went down with my daughter and she and I were were patting Waldo, um, and he was in his cave, and Waldo loved to be patted. And Tracy was lying down on the sand, and she had her feet along the coral reef, and Waldo suddenly disappeared and went back into his cave, and then Tracy felt something on her ankle. And she looked down at her ankle, and there was Waldo, and he had his jaws around her ankle, and was just gently shaking her, like a, again, like a dog would shake you to play with you. And Tracy's an absolute, she has a soul that just animals feel. She has a really great communication with animals. She looked down, she was only 13 or something, smiled, said, oh, he's playing with me to herself. No jump, she didn't startle or anything, she was cool. And he did a little bit of shake shake, then he let go, went back into his cave, came out again, looked at her, and she patted him again. Now this is a moray eel. You know, there, they, there are behaviors and there are intuitions and there are brains or connections that we are just beginning to understand in the ocean. Well, they've um, been around sharks been around. F hundreds of millions of years, yeah, and yeah. we're like fledglings here on the planet. Yeah, yeah. So of course they've had to evolve yeah. a, a certain abilities. They feel our electrical. You know, yes, correct. Our, they feel our, electrical energy. Yeah. And they feel yeah. our good electrical like energy. Dolphins can see through us as yeah. though x-rays. So yes, there yeah. are um, many things we can learn from these species that have been here for hundreds of millions of years and yeah. evolved mm -hmm. in a communication system. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us to, I mean, we are, our hubris and our egos feel like we're so superior when um, many times I think, as I'm sure you do, Wendy, yeah. that we're inferior. Yeah. Especially our behavior is so self-destructive. Yeah. Yes, you know. yes, yes, so, absolutely. Well, with the chemicals, for instance. Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. Peter always used to do the Henry Beston quote, which yeah. is talks about other nations. Um, they are they are not inferior. They are they are other nations who are their own wonderful, wonderful place, and, and they that are. we need to respect. They are. 
respect their yeah. their world and their yes. nationhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I I hope that um, I mean I feel that we are at a moment in time with the oceans where the world is coming to grips with how important the oceans are. Uh, now, may, many people in the world just are coming to grips because they realize it's a, a main food source yeah. of protein for us. Mm -hmm. So there's that economic driver where, mm -hmm. where we've got to save enough of it in order to help feed uh, the peoples of the world. Uh, but then, of course, there's the existential importance of and the beauty of the ocean and the whole ecosystem and the whole world um, that we depend upon the ocean for our oxygen <laughs> um, and and the acidification and all the other the reefs the, uh, yeah and the reefs for the for the bread basket of, yeah. of the world so I I I I have hope um, I think that that um, you know it took a long time for us to understand about the rainforests and, and I think mm -hmm. we're at that moment now where all of the environmental groups and the many of the governments are making marine protected areas. I mean, the Phoenix Islands, and, and I know Indonesia's looking at it, and, the, and we've, uh, in Hawaii we have some. And so slowly but surely, we're, we're making movement that way. Do you think we're beyond the tipping point, so-called? <sighs> I just, you know... I think climate change is just such a major catastrophe for the world that, that I, I don't quite know how we're going to cope, how the oceans are going to cope with climate change. Um, maybe it'll be slow enough that certain species will survive in the ocean. But uh, I, I mean, Peter and I went down to the Galapagos for the geographic years ago. Uh, before an El Nino event and then after an El Nino event. And it was dramatic, just the change in, in temperature of the, of the water so that, that the blue-footed booby had to, had to dive too deep to get the fish. And they were dying by the thousands because by the time they got down a little bit deeper, the, the water was warmer on top. Mm -hmm. They had to dive deeper to mm -hmm. get the fish. By the time they got up, they had expended so much energy that that fish wasn't enough to keep them alive. So the sea, sea lions were dying. And, the, and that was not an extreme um, temperature change in the water. So mm. it's hard. I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist. I only, yeah. so I, I don't know. But Experientially, I do. and you network with people around the world. I do, I do. So you have a sense, it's pretty, Wendy. It's very, you know. very upsetting. Um, yeah. So one just, however, has to keep trying and, yeah. um, and, and, and working on the issue and hoping that the governments and the people of the world will come together and especially in the United States, that we mm. will begin to lead again uh, and, and take control of our destiny. Uh, you know, You're <laughs> a very positive person. It reminds <laughs> me of that quote from Peter uh, about you being able to find a little bit of tinsel on every tree. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> You're darling to you know, know that quote. That's a beautiful quote. Uh, yeah. Well, he, I, I think yeah. he... Yes, it's, it's, but you know, when you look back at history, there were times of great despair. Yes. And, and people did band together and pull through. And I, I, I actually was reading an article maybe a year ago about how we mobilized in the, well, how, how Great Britain mobilized for the Second World War, and then how we mobilized, and how we turned our economy around in six months. I mean, we made a huge change, and I think we can do that again. We just need the leadership, and we need the people to be saying, to, to demand it. So um, I, I, have, I, have, I really do have great faith in, in people mobilizing to make things happen. Well, um, I do as well. Yeah. And um, it's nice to hear someone with your breadth of experience and exposure and what you're doing globally now, Wendy, through Shark Savers. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 
great organization. I'm glad that you're stepping up mm -hmm. after Peter's death um, to really get involved with Shark Savers. And what is your vision for well, Shark you. Savers, you. Wendy? I, you know, I, um, I've, I've always felt yeah. that um, we needed a group that yeah. was small and laser-like and nimble mm -hmm. and could just mm -hmm. absolutely concentrate on the apex predators yes. and sharks and yeah. um, the, the the finning of sharks and and shark savers is is that group. They um, we have a really excellent uh, program mm -hmm. in in China in the mm -hmm. Asian countries. Sp spoken by Asians, films by Asians, uh, offices run by Asians, and they uh, and, and there now that it's going. I mean, there is huge interest in in developing programs that will educate people so that people will back off from shark fin soup. And just the other day, the Chinese mm -hmm. government uh, banned shark fin soup at government um, huge. functions. Huge. That's huge. Isn't that great? That's wonderful. Yeah. And Congratulations. You were shark savers. Well, I, I think it was pressure from shark savers, mm -hmm. from Wild Aid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's World Wildlife, mm -hmm. you know, the, oh, yeah, oh, you know, yeah. everybody's working on this. But I think Shark Savers is, is very good yeah. because we, we don't have a huge bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people on the ground mm -hmm. who are working directly with governments and, mm -hmm. and making MPAs mm -hmm. um, come about. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be working with them. And, um, and, I, and I think the JAWS legacy is very much that that it's a conservation legacy that we yes. need to. And so I'm hoping all the Jaws fans will will come aboard and support one group or another that's working with sharks or working with the ocean in general. Uh, and that's that's what I'm hoping to do with the with the republication of Jaws as an ebook. And um, we're actually finally going to have a Peter Benchley website. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, where I will. Hey, I met your web mm -hmm. designer yes. today. Yes, yeah, Laura Bowling. Yes. And she's working hard on this. That is a so great So there'll be idea. lots of information about Peter and, and pictures and interviews and, perfect. yeah, yeah. So I think any, anybody who clicks on that and yeah. wants to know more about Peter and Jaws, they yeah. will see a lot of information Excellent. about sharks. And yes. they can go and, and, uh, and connect to other groups that are working on these issues. What do you think about Jaws Fest 2012 on Martha's Vineyard, Wendy? <laughs> <It's great. laughs> yeah, he is, and, um, and amazing what it she's is. done. It is yeah. incredible, and bravo to her. Yeah. And she was the one who really, when she called me and said, "Would you participate?" Yes. And she said, "I just want you to know, right mm -hmm. off the bat, that this is going to be a great deal about sharks and education and right. conservation." Yes. And uh, and. And that's exactly what it is. And she's put together really a great programs, lots of panels, lots of fun, mm -hmm. informative um, exhibits, mm -hmm. wonderful exhibits. Yes. And, uh, and art and conservation in Oak yes. Bluffs. Yes. And so I have yet to go see that. I think mm -hmm. that's tomorrow yeah. going to the opening there. So, okay. uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that this is heading in this direction, and bravo to her and bravo mm -hmm. to everybody who's participating, including you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Peter Benchley, for uh, JAWS and having not only the vision to write the book, but most importantly, to take the book JAWS and the film JAWS, and as Wendy was just sharing with us, that it becomes a legacy, which is so desperately needed at this time in history, to stop the senseless slaughter of 75 to 100 million sharks each year just for their fins. And I think that's a wonderful legacy. And what Wendy's doing with Shark Savers, desperately needed, timing couldn't be better. And also, too, to Susan for setting this up, Jaws Fest 2012 on Martha's Vineyard to bring people like Wendy, Greg Skomel, and others to educate did you speak with the Oak Bluff Selectman yet? I have not. No. Are you going to? Oh, well, I hope. I hope so, too. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, all of this is for the betterment of the world, which is hurting so much at this time in history. And thank you for what you're doing, Wendy. Hmm. Um, it's a 
pleasure to meet you, to feel your energy, and to, in Peter's name, yeah. create a beautiful legacy for the world, oh, for the you. wildlife of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. I, I feel it's, I'm, I feel very privileged, you know, yeah. really to be in this spot. So thank you. And thank you, uh, my audience on Martha's Vineyard, for joining us today on the William Waterway interview. And we'll look forward to next time. Bye for now.